Šie virzieni lielāko desi saistīti gan ar mobilo telefonu, gan ar biometriju. Mobilais telefons ir ļoti, ļoti pateicīgi tādu universālu līdzekli, tāpēc, ka pat mūsdienās cilvēki var iziet no mājas bez naudas maka, piemēram, tur ar bērniem uz rotaļlaukumu vai kaut kur, bet bez telefona šodien ir reti, kurš iziet ārā. 2015. gadā The Economist aprēķināja, ka kopējie zaudējumi kibernoziegumu rezultātā, kas ir radušies visā pasaulē, ir apmēram 500 miljardi dolāru. Mēs strādājam pie tā, lai aizsargātu jūsu digitālo identitāti. Tas, ko mēs gribam izdarīt, lai identitātes aizsardzība būtu reizē droša un, un reizē arī vienkārša, lai cilvēkam par to nebūtu ikdienā jādomā. Rodās jauna regulējuma Eiropas Savienībā, kas uh, dod iespēju jauniem spēlētājiem palielināt konkurenciju maksājumu tirgu un uh, arī nebanku spēlētājiem ienāk šajā sfērā ar jau specifiskiem un, un tā teikt, mērtiecīgi vadītiem produktiem uh, konkrētām vajadzībām. Ja uh, cilvēki reģistrējušies uh, mūsu aplikācijā, uh, tev nav jāzina nekādi saņēmēja bankas rekvizīti, tev jāzina tikai viņa telefons un uh, ar uh, pāris spogas piedieniem var viegli pārskaitīt maksājumu šim te saņēmējiem. Turklāt, ja jūs ap divi esat dažādās bankās, maksājums aiziet tūlītai. Uzņēmumi, kam ir lieli izejošo maksājumu skaiti un ienākošo maksājumu skaiti, mēs viņiem piedāvājam automatizāciju pārskaitījumiem uz dažādām bankām. Identitāte un bankas konts tiek piesaistīts pie pirkstu nospiedumu. Termināls atpazīst un noteikti transakcija. Ļoti ērti, nav jānes līdz ne telefonu, naudas māku, piemēram, par pie pludmalēju nopirkt kaut ko, vai, vai vienkārši nav, nav baiši, ka varētu kaut ko nozakt, piemēram, trolejbusā pārpildītā. Otrs šādi paši šajā virzienā ir sejas atpazīšana. Tad ir atpazīšana pēc balsts, vēl pat mazliet trakāks, tas ir sirdspukstu ritma mērīšana. Ja mūsu sistēma, programmatūra būtu saistīta kaut kādā veidā vai, vai ieviesta e-veselībā, tad, tad, piemēram, ārsts izrakstot recepti, nošifrētu šo recepti ar, ar, ar savu atslēgu un arī ar manu atslēgu. Tad, kad es aiziet pie aptiekā, tajā brīdī, kad viņš nospiest viņu apskatīties, tad atnākt man pieprasījums vai es ļauju konkrētajam aptiekāram apskatīties manu recepti, es uz telefonu nospiestu ļauju, viņš varētu viņu izlasīt, un pēc tam tie recepti atkal aizvērtos, un viņi vairs nebūtu izlasāmi. Ja mēs runājam tieši par finanšu jomu, izmantojot mūsu produktu, tad, ja vienā bankā jūs jau esat identificēts, tad šī te banka varētu šo identitāti nodot arī nākamajai bankai, varbūt par nelielu, bet godīgu samaksu, bet viņiem nebūtu katru reizi tas jāsāk no jauna. Un otra lieta, izmantojot savu identitāti, jūs varat parakstīt tranzakcijas, tā kā līdzīgi kā to dara elektronisko parakstu. Nebūs tā, ka tev ir jāiet obligāti uz banku, saņem šos te pakalpojumus, tu viņus varēsi saņemt daudz automatizētāk un vairāk tajā tieši pārdošanas vietā, piemēram. Nepazudīs nekur sadarbības ar bankām, jo joprojām tādā vidējā termiņā bankas noteikti saglabās šo te drošības karogu daudzām darbībām, apakšā tajā pat laikā šo te komunikācijas platformu. To jau varēs izvēlēties katrs cilvēks vai katrs biznesas atbilstoši savām vajadzībām. Protams, kas notiks pēc 20-30 gadiem, tas ir, nu, cik tālu cilvēkiem sniegsies fantāzija, tik tālu arī to visu varēs attīstīt, jo robeža visnībā nav. Labrīt, dāmas un kungi. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. We are starting the annual conference held by the Bank of Latvia dedicated to the payments of the 22nd century future starts today and since the conference is international we will continue in English and those who require interpreting please use the headphones that will be made available to you throughout the conference Excellencies we are about to start the Bank of Latvia annual conference uh, this time this is payments in the 22nd century future starts today. We consider this really actual topic and uh, we will held uh, several speeches, first by Deputy Governor Ms. Zoya Razmusov, which will provide opening of the conference. Then we will have keynote speech of the 
Mr. Yves Mersch, European Central Bank Governing Council and Executive Board Member. And then we will have two panels. First will be devoted more like visionary, where we are heading to. Another one will be more practical one. You are very much invited to take part because there will be possibility to use Twitter. You can pose questions also from the audience. And actually there is hashtag uh, you can see on, on, on the screens. Hashtag is um, future of payments. And also, please, those which are needed, uh, there is Wi-Fi connection. Also, you can see password uh, payments of this 22nd century and, and, and uh, Latvia's bank. That might be needed because there could be also uh, polls and uh, you might be interested also to take part in that. And so, I invite Mrs. Zoya Rasmussa, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Latvia, to, to provide opening of the conference. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's my great, great pleasure to welcome you to the annual conference of Latvia's Bank. I would like to note that the mentioning of tw sec 20, I'm sorry, <laughs> mentioning of the 23rd century in the title of the conference is not a technical error. This year is very special as we celebrate the centenary of the Republic of Latvia. We are proud of our country and would like to have longer term perspective and think about payments over the next hundred of years. We are economists and we know that the longer the horizon of the forecasts, the less precise they are. Central bank is most and first about money. And the title of the conference reflected this as well. Since 2014, the euro has been our money. One of the functions of the money is to be store of value. Euro area monetary policy is aimed at ensuring that euro remains a reliable store of value is reflected in the aim to keep annual inflation below or close to 2% over the medium term. Another equally important function of money is to be medium of exchange. Payments play a key role in the smooth functioning of the economy and this area has greatly evolved in the recent decades, in particular the last several years. Central banks are playing a fundamental role in facilitating a secure, efficient and innovative payment service. This is the focus of our conference today. Instant payments provide a good notion of what modern financial services should be like. Just The 21st century consumer expects uh, any service to be online, here and now. Paying invoices, making purchases or transferring funds to individuals or businesses can take place at any hour of day and night and from any location with internet access. It only requires a couple of clicks and seconds for the money to reach the recipient. Instant payments are quick, convenient, secure, and user-friendly. The progress has, that has been reached in the domain of interbank transfers during the last generation is impressive. Just a bit more than 20 years ago in Latvia, there was one interbank clearing cycle. It was paper-based, and transactions between commercial banks, clients, at that time, it took a few days to complete. Today, instant interbank transfers can be executed within a matter of seconds, 24 hours a day, and seven days a week. 
The 28th August of 2018 marks a year since Latvia's bank became the first Euro area central bank to introduce the instant payment infrastructure based on SEPA scheme. This is an infrastructure for commercial banks and other payment service providers which have the task of providing these services to their customers. The Euro system will launch the target instant payment settlement service on 13th of November 2018, enabling pay payment service providers to offer fund transfers in the real time around the clock, 365 days a year in secure central bank money. At the same time, today's conference is about much more than instant payments. Today we would, would like to discuss the major trends shaping the industry and understand what the path forward is. The conditions for new developments are very favorable. On one hand, consumers are increasingly looking for fast, convenient and affordable services that suit their changing habits. On the other hand, the advances in technology facilitate the creation of innovative solutions with the potential of causing fundamental digitalization-led changes in the sector. It will result in a significant switch to contactless, mobile and instant payments available around the clock in the near future. Latest generations of smartphones offer several options to access payments applications using biometrical identity like fingerprint, eye screening and face recognition technologies. Innovations such as DLT, cloud computing, artificial intelligence will transform marketplace over the time. It's clear that in the future further improvements in payment services will not be about speed anymore. In a few years' time, when the completion of payment transactions within seconds will have become the new standard, for all practical purposes, further improvements in speed are unlikely to be of importance. Instant payments are now being implemented at pan-European level. It is equally clear that payments continue to migrate away from cash and become less visible to the customer as consumers shift towards mobile and online channels. While we are unlikely to move to 100% cashless society in the near future, the incompatibility between cash and digital marketplaces or digital platforms means that the payments will continue to move towards cashless solutions. An overview of payment trends would be incomplete without mentioning crypto assets, even though they remain controversial and they are still being discussed. The high volatility of crypto assets shows that they cannot be a reliable mean of store of value and their global use as means of payments remains marginal. Nevertheless, they have demonstrated the potential of the blockchain technology behind it. The technology is now being studied and tested by many financial market participants. Central banks are not the exception, primarily testing the possibility of adopting the technology for financial market infrastructure and payment systems. Even considering the short and medium term outlook, it's impossible to say with certainty how the landscape of financial services will evolve. Digitalization and fintech, as well as possibilities offered by big data and artificial intelligence, are attracting new providers to the market and fostering the introduction of novel business models. The new payments services directive has initiated a shift in the way payment services are offered and by whom they are offered. The increased competition between fintech, big tech and banks 
contributes to the disaggregation of established chain value, value chains. These developments can clearly have a disruptive impact on the payment market. When discussing the ample opportunities of payments in the future, we shouldn't forget the challenges that arise concerning supervision and regulation. The increasing digitalization and technological advancements pose more complex risk, particularly in the terms of cybersecurity, financial crimes, and data protection. There is a fine line between stifling innovations by regulating too early and failing to protect consumers or customers by regulating too little and too late. A balanced approach is needed to ensure a level playing field for all market participants at the same time remaining technologically neutral. Closer cooperation between industry participants and regulators across different sectors could be the answer for ensuring the challenges brought about by the digital world and handled in the best possible way. I am sure that there are other keywords besides secure, instant and cashless that will characterize the payments of the future. However, we have an excellent keynote speaker and two fantastic panels of experts. Therefore, I would like to hang over to them to explore further the domain of payments. I wish us all the day of interesting presentations and fruitful debates. Thank you very much for your attention. And now it's time for keynote speech for uh, Mr. Yves Smirsch, European Central Bank Governing Council and Exec Executive Board Member. Please, floor is yours. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning also to all those uh, who watch on the screen. When the governor of Latvia's bank asked me in, I think must have been back beginning of this year, January, February, whether I would participate in a conference on the payment system in the 21st, 22nd century, I responded to him, I'm not sure whether I have sufficient knowledge about the uh, payment system in the 22nd century before Christ. And then he said, okay, uh, then we have to complete the title of the conference and we say the future starts today. So um, then I understood that it was uh, speaking about where we move from today on and not speaking about the past where we are also had already payment systems which maybe were uh, a little bit less performant than the one we are aiming at today. But predicting what payments will look like uh, from today on into the future is perhaps best left to science fiction writers than to central bankers, which by definition should uh, try not to have a too vivid imagination, but try to be boring. But uh, there is one thing I can promise. The payments of tomorrow will be much more than the cash of yesterday meaning that they will be instant. And we didn't wait for the 22nd century to see this happen. Non-cash instant payments are already a reality today in several places uh, in the world and also throughout uh, Europe. 
We have seen in the past the launch of uh, SEPA instant credit transfer scheme, which have been developed by the, at the behest of the European Retail Payments Board. At the request uh, of this uh, board, the banks from the Baltic countries were among the first to embrace instant payments with a number of them that are joining the scheme from day one. However, now we are at a critical stage for implementing instant payments. The number of banks that uh, are offering instant payment services to their clients is steadily growing. We had had a slightly hesitant uh, start, but uh, now we are growing fast. As is the use of such services also by European people and European businesses. In November, we will launch target instant payment settlement, so-called TIPS, as Deputy Governor has just referred to. The Eurosystem service for instant payment settlement across Europe in central bank money. With this service, the Eurosystem is addressing the evolving needs of market participants and also supporting market integration by facilitating pan-European reach at the time when the issuance of its new series of safe and widely trusted banknotes is nearing completion. Why do I make this rapprochement when I arrived at the Riga airport yesterday? The driver wanted to uh, pay his airport parking ticket uh, with a mobile app, but he had some problems doing the connectivity. So after five minutes, I told him, can I offer you some cash? old-fashioned cash to do the service. Okay, joke being apart, the move towards instant payments is not just good news for end users. It is also good news for the European payments industries. Cards are now the most popular and fastest growing non-cash payment instrument in Europe. And many of the most prominent innovations in payments are still today also card-based. Think of contactless payments, mobile wallets, as I just mentioned, if they work, as well as many online payment solutions. However, this is an area which is dominated by non-European players, with international card schemes taking the lead. European players are fragmented and lagging behind, not least because of the lack of a pan-European card scheme or even interoperable card networks. In this context, we should strive for a truly pan-European instant solution rather than repeat the past shortcomings that I just mentioned. Thanks to instant payments, European market players can now become leaders in innovation and that based on European standards. The SEPA credit, instant credit transfer scheme and the infrastructures that have been developed to process instant payments from the ideal basis of, for innovative payment solutions that meet the needs of today's and of tomorrow's end users. Let's be clear. This is more than just a need for speed. European people and businesses are looking for payment solutions that fit seamlessly into their daily lives and into their daily business processes. From person-to-person -person payment to online marketplaces and from micropayments to Industry 4.0. Each of these payment solutions could be enhanced by an instant payment feature. But they also require additional services to create a smooth and secure 
payment experience. Payment solutions can be integrated into or linked to mobile apps for ordering goods and services, thereby providing vendors with real-time confirmation of incoming payments. And instant payments can also be integrated into business software and will undoubtedly pave the way for many additional services. This is where market players can provide added value and at the same time create new business opportunities. But market players need to take action. Payment service providers around Europe need to start offering their new customers instant payment services and they need to do so quickly. Experience from other market developments, from photography to music to bookshops, shows that when disruption hits, established players can quickly lose their seemingly comfortable position and find themselves struggling to remain relevant. Thanks to instant payments, the European payments industry can create a pan-European platform for innovation. But only if everyone in Europe can pay each other instantly across borders also, and the service is not restricted to the customers of certain banks or agglomeration of banks, or restricted to residents of particular countries. Moreover, payment services providers should not erect any barriers to the uptake of instant payments, for example, by offering them through a limited number of channels or by charging prohibitively high fees. Such strategies will only end up by driving the consumers to other players. No one owns the consumer, especially in an innovative environment driven by technology. Web and technology giants are already standing by, knocking at the door, eager to leverage their existing user base to quickly gain market share in payment services. At this at the moment where some incumbent participants, market participants, are trying to protect themselves against small startups and fintechs. To achieve economies of scale and benefit from the integrated European payments market, providers of instant payment services should also ensure that their services are truly pan-European. Their customers should be able to send and receive payments across Europe in line with the principles of the single euro payments area. And I remember vividly when we had in the governing council the discussion on whether to launch TIPS, that one of my arguments was directed towards the governors representing smaller countries. And I said, if you want to end up with having the supply of three or four solutions which only work in large countries, you might end up as being a blank page on the map of Europe in payment systems. And that's why we need pan-European systems. Ensuring this reachability is the responsibility of each individual payment service provider. But the Euro system, on its part, is also helping to facilitate pan-European reach. Our new TIPS service is an optimal position to do so. It has been designed as a simple extension of our existing single shared platform, Target2, with its extensive network of over 1,700 participants and more than 51,000 addressable bank identifier codes. Its pricing policy also helps to achieve a broad reach. There will be no charge 
in tips for opening and maintaining an account or for receiving payments and reporting. For the first two years of operation, the price per initiated transaction is set at 0.0002 cents, meaning one-fifth of a cent, with no charges for the first 10 million payments settled on each TIPS account by the end of 2019. In addition, TIPS will offer a flexible participation structure allowing market participants to participate in TIPS directly or to connect as a reachable party and to use an instructing party to send instructions on their behalf. With this very flexible structure, we are not only providing a new standalone infrastructure, but also allowing the market to leverage existing clearing arrangements subject to market participants' choices in order to maximize the integration benefits of the new service and avoiding a monopolist position. This approach is consistent with that of the existing Eurosystem target services as well as with any of our new initiatives that we are taking on our platforms to promote euro area wide smooth and efficient payment systems in line with what is written in the treaty and it's our mandate we might even have to reflect maybe in the future on whether to deliver on our objective we might have to reflect on broader access to central bank accounts for retail purposes if that would be needed. A clear parallel can be drawn with our aim to foster a true domestic capital market in the euro area via a so-called European Distribution of Debt Instrument Initiatives, acronym EDI. The issuance, trading, clearing and settlement of a security in the EU should not be affected by the location of the issuers, the investors or intermediaries. So the idea of EDI is to facilitate the centralized issuance and distribution services for European debt securities, again exploring synergies with other target services and the Eurosystem collateral management system that we are about to set up. The Governing Council recently has agreed to investigate the next steps for this EDI initiative service based again on the guiding principles of efficiency, safety, harmonization and neutrality. But this was a bracket, I come back to instant payments why I'm here. This network, instant payments, should then be used as a basis for pan-European and user solutions. The existence of such a possibility offers almost limitless opportunities to design new innovative services on top of this basic SEPA instant credit transfer scheme throughout Europe. In fact, we can already see several initiatives flourishing around Europe mobile payment solutions for person-to-person -person and also for point-of-sale payments, to name just a few. Unfortunately, many of these new solutions seem to be limited to one country or even just to a few banks within a single country. Unless this changes, users of these services will not be able to benefit from the pan-European nature of SEPA instant credit transfer. They will have to look for alternatives when they travel, when they order goods and services from other countries, or when they do business across Europe. And they will not care whether these alternatives in the end will be based on the European schemes 
or not. It would indeed be a great pity if fragmentation were to be reintroduced at the end user level. Suppliers should strive for pan European designs using the common standards and working together with stakeholders in order to avoid such fragmentation. Take point of sale payments, which make up the largest segment of retail payments market in terms of transaction volumes. Vendors of all types and sizes could benefit from increased cost efficiency and improved cash management if they could accept instant payments at the point of sale. Point of sale solutions for instant payments could also allow businesses that do not accept cards for, for example, for cost regions or practical reasons, to offer their customers the choice to pay electronically. Such solutions should not replicate the situations that we see in Europe for cards with non-interoperable national solutions. They should be based on common standards so that consumers can make instant payments at point of sales anywhere in Europe. And I think the smaller the country, the less I need to insist on this. The SEPA instant credit transfer scheme and the new instant payments infrastructures have laid the foundations for a future-proof European payments landscape. Now it is up to the market to build on that foundation. This means offering instant payment services that meet clients' needs, but also, I underline, at attractive prices. Charging prohibitive fees when we only charge 0.2 cents will not support the take-up of instant payments. On the contrary, it would only drive customers towards other players. Rather than being driven by the services offered by other players, why not drive developments yourselves and reap the respective benefits? Those market participants that take this opportunity to offer innovative payment services to their customer at pan-European level will be ready for the payments landscape of tomorrow and beyond, perhaps even into the 22nd century. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, you Thank you. excellent keynote. And please sit down, let's have a chat. And may I please also invite the other participants of the first panel to come on the stage, uh, please. So while, while they are coming, although Eves was uh, already introduced, uh, there's one uh, interesting fact about him. He's actually the longest serving member of the ECB governing council, uh, so been there for almost 20 years, I guess. Uh, so it's very, very interesting if you put that together with innovating the central bank now and, and being the longest serving uh, ECB governing council member. Uh, but let's, let's introduce also all the other panelists. So hey, it's little John. Uh, uh, CEO of uh, EBA Clearing uh, also has held uh, former uh, high-level management positions at, at the UBS and uh, also one interesting fact about uh, Hayes is that he has lived in, in Brazil in the 1980s when Brazil was going through the hyperinflation uh, well, uh, period, should I say so. so. So he has some interesting experience from that. Uh, then, uh, on, the, on, on the far right uh, from, from you, not, not in political terms, but uh, just uh, where he sits, is Teppo Paola. Um, so Teppo, I don't know whether uh, Teppo is a household name in, in Finland, uh, but uh, what, is, uh, what is certain is that he has worked for a number of household names, so, such as G, Capital, PayPal, 
uh, now BBVA uh, most uh, recently. Uh, so uh, I not only worked, but actually also held uh, positions where he has shaped the uh, strategy of, uh, of, of those companies, digital strategy in, in particular. And uh, he's also been in, 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 into professional tennis. Uh, so uh, recently he tried to return. That didn't go out so well. It didn't work out so well. But uh, maybe we're lucky because of that to, to have him uh, here. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, Martinich Kazaks, uh, also from uh, Latvijas Bank. Now, uh, shall I say, uh, probably, no, definitely uh, the number one uh, macroeconomist uh, in, uh, in Latvia. So we're very happy to uh, have him here. Uh, he's, uh, well, about interesting facts, I guess. Uh, I don't know whether that's uh, interesting to everybody, but uh, he's very fond of fishing. Uh, so uh, that's his uh, main, uh, main uh, hobby. Uh, but he never goes to Kamchatka. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, uh, with that, uh, let uh, let me turn uh, to the uh, to the substance matter. Okay, uh, I, I forgot. Sorry to introduce myself for those who need this introduction. I'm Andres Strass, advisor at the Bank of uh, Latvia. I'm definitely the least knowledgeable uh, person about payments uh, here uh, on on the stage uh, today. So that's why I'm uh, in the role of basically just asking uh, questions, uh, hopefully they are okay, but if they're not okay, uh, I can also solicit some help from you, and, and we have this slido.com thing that uh, yours mentioned in, uh, in the beginning, so you can go to slido.com, log on with the ca hashtag future of payments, and then uh, in the second half of the panel, I will try to pick uh, some of those questions as well, so you can uh, help me actually, because many of you are also more knowledgeable about payments than, uh, than, than I am. Uh, so let's see where, where, where that brings us, but uh, I, will, uh, I will kick this off uh, by a follow-up question to Yves, because uh, in one of your uh, recent speeches uh, you, you mentioned also this uh, necessity uh, uh, for Europe to think about a European rooted European-based global payments uh, system. Uh, so could, uh, could what you described today be uh, the basis for, uh, for such a system? Our intention is uh, to develop Euro area-wide infrastructure. But if this infrastructure is efficient, both in terms uh, of meeting the needs of customers and is efficient in its cost to business and intermediaries, then why would we not make our systems more open to other currencies which might like to join European platforms uh, because of economies of scale? And I think this addresses above all small and medium-sized economies uh, or economies uh, where they experience a much stronger recession of cash as we uh, do it in Europe. You know that in Europe uh, the growth of cash de uh, demand is still close to 7% um, and non-cash payments has a growth of uh, hardly 7.9%. So there's not a big difference between the two. But in some smaller economies you see an issue with cash availability. So they have to address their own national problem, look at what uh, the European market is offering, and we are ready to participate, to have to open to participation of such uh, economies and currencies on our infrastructure. Mm. Now, now I have a second quick follow-up question. Actually, uh, you mentioned also payment cards uh, ex explicitly, also the lack of, kind of U European based uh, single payment cards uh, solution uh, that would be rooted in, in Europe. But uh, speaking about payment cards, uh, can't it be that they are also a kind of diesel engines of the payments uh, world? They are very popular now. Uh, they are growing still. Uh, in usage, but at some point there will be something that will o overtake, or, or, or wouldn't you agree? You see, it could be either regulation or it could be uh, uh, technological leaps uh, forward, but basically what determines the success of a product 
is not its intrinsic value. It is the acceptability by the customer. And we are determined that our mandate is to offer the customer the choice and the customer will decide which will be the best solution going forward. And I'm not very much in favor of doing this by regulation, by, by leaving the choice to the customer. So from uh, that point of view, uh, to come back to your question of cards, we had in Europe the two largest economies. One said, we have the volume and we offer a card. The second economy said, well, we have the brain and we offer a better card. Unfortunately, the two were not able to talk to each other. With the result that we have in the two largest economies, two card systems which are not interoperable, and what did the customer do? But it resorted to non-European cards which are usable all over Europe. If that is a solution, uh, I think we <coughs> might not be very clever. Okay, thank you. It was about Germany and France, but you didn't say that, uh, <laughs> so you can blame it on me. Uh, hey, so you're also running already a clearing uh, system and also have introduced instant payments uh, and probably also looking uh, beyond that, 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 that uh, what, what could the future bring? So can you tell us briefly about that? Yes, I hope you don't mind. I brought a few slides along, but before I go into the can slides... Can we have the slides, please? Up. Yeah, before we go into the slides, just a, a, a quick story, maybe picking up on a couple of themes from Eve Marsh. Um, EBA Clearing, for those who don't know us, are the, is, is, a, is a clearing infrastructure, a pan-European one. It was created in 1998, just before the dawn of the euro, in order to do high-value high payments complementarily <clears throat> together with Target, which now is Target 2. In uh, 2008, uh, retail payments were introduced in order to uh, facilitate the uptake of SEPA payments, and uh, this was a collaborative effort as well. And the story behind EBA Clearing is really one of uh, pan-European, but pan-European by design and pan-European by desire. It's always a collaborative effort between a number of banks across Europe, big and small, who have all worked together to, to uh, solve common problems. Uh, first high value, then retail, and now most recently instant payments. So um, we are pan-European from the ground up. Um, we are uh, run as a not-for-profit, uh, we are a public, se a private sector initiative. Uh, we are owned by the banks, um, but we are, are are not running this company for profit. So the the, the costs are kept uh, low, and cost optimization is a key key concern for our users, which I think also supports some of the um, the messages that were made. Um, in developing the real time payments, I just thought I'd give a few quick uh, statistics on where we are with this. Just press it really. Stop. There we go. Yes. Um, so. In 2014, uh, we, a bunch of banks got together from across Europe and, and decided to write a blueprint as to what instant payments could look like. And in 2015, after the ECB, through the uh, Euro Retail Payments Board, uh, issued its challenge, uh, our banks, our participants said, OK, we can do this. Let's do something together. And uh, we launched an initiative through, through our, um, our, our company to start RT1, what became RT1. And the idea of RT1 was to be ready on the first day of the instant payments processing scheme. And uh, we achieved that. Um, we achieved it through a, a funding round of, of, of 39 banks across Europe. And these banks, what makes them interesting is they were big and they were small. They were from all corners of Europe. We had uh, the new, one of the newest banks had their license for only six months and we had the oldest bank in the world as part of that group. So it's a quite a diverse group that came together to build this. It's an optional scheme. And you know, I think some of the things that, that uh, were referred to earlier are a result of the fact that it is an optional scheme. It takes a while for this to, to, to set, but we've made a great start. And I'll just give a, a few facts and figures. We started on the 21st of November. We're running 24 seven, stable. We're currently processing about 20,000 payments a day. We've already processed three million since the launch. Actually, it's closer to 4 million now. And 99% of, pro of the payments that we process are processed in a couple of seconds. So the, the scheme foresees that it should be uh, 10 seconds or less, but we're actually experiencing under, under two uh, for almost all of the payments. Uh, this makes it quite usable in a point of sale context. And uh, when the, uh, the acceptance uh, at point of sale through 
financial uh, institutions and, and intermediaries becomes available, or, or fintechs as the case may be, um, this will facilitate retail uptake, uh, this kind of performance. And this is account to account. Um, the country view, the pan-European view, um, so 10 months on, nearly 11, um, we have uh, very good coverage. Uh, you can see here in the dark blue uh, the countries that are covered. There are a couple of, of ones that are coming a bit later. Uh, this will grow. Um, we have 13 countries now, 29 active participants. We have uh, three more from the Baltics that are, are set to go live in, in the next uh, weeks. Um, we have close to 100% um, reach amongst those that have adhered to the SCT INST uh, scheme. So it's looking like a pretty good start. And by uh, the end of 2019, we expect that the coverage will, will continue to increase and uh, the, 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 the blue will get bluer, the dark blue. And we expect that the uh, indicative reach in each country will be according to those colors. So in most of um, the, the countries, whether it's uh, Spain, where we have a very good reach already, um, or, or uh, Finland or Austria, uh, we are looking at nearly 100% reach by the end of, of 2019. Um, the way this looks in terms of the number of participants, uh, we started with, uh, with 20. Uh, we're currently at 29, as I mentioned. At the end of November, um, that will go to uh, over 40. And if you look at it in terms of the number of accounts or the number of, of participants that can be reached through those institutions that come as direct participants, we're looking at about 50% of European um, accounts already uh, by the end of uh, this year and closer to 90% by the end of next year. So together with some of the initiatives um, and with TIPS, um, I think the goal of having the reachability, at least at the supply side, by the end of next year uh, should be quite well underway. Now that doesn't mean that everything is given. The supply side is only part of the story and as, as uh, uh, Yves Marsh was mentioning, it's also very important that the, the demand side and the product side, the services and customer uptake also increase. Um, we've, uh, part of our, our, our plan was to be there quickly, uh, learn and iterate. Um, we're going to our third version which will be implemented in November um, in one year. And in that, we will uh, uh, mention, as mentioned before, offer tri uh, TIPS instructing party functionality, to, uh, allowing the participants in RT1 to have access to TIPS at a very, very reasonable price, no, no upcharge, in fact. Um, and the, um, this will allow those banks that want to uh, uh, reach both pan-European systems to be able to do so simply and with a single, uh, single um, project. Um, we've also introduced closed user groups for uh, those banks that want to go faster than 10 seconds uh, as a rule or who don't want an amount limit. And an amount limit is important to consider when we think about B2B and uptake in, uh, in the commercial space. And last but not least, we'll be um, offering a third connectivity option, which is to use SWIFT in addition to eBix and, and CNET. Um, which will also go live in, in November. So I, I, I think we're off to a good start. And I, I think one of the key things, it's not uh, a mandatory scheme. There is no legislation yet. But I think in con contrast to some of the earlier initiatives and payments, this one is going quite fast. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, I, I have a follow-up question. Since you mentioned <coughs> that uh, commercial banks actually were the ones pushing uh, you to do this, uh, this kind of thing. So is, is there kind of... Uh, uh, fee feedback are you pushing them now to develop say point of sales uh, solutions um, in terms in terms of pushing um, you know we challenge uh, we're more on the other side so what we've developed is a, a, a product agnostic uh, system so it can be used for anything um, and then we have working groups with the users where we determine what the next steps will be and so the next steps that are really important for uh, for these things to facilitate the uptake, and I would say it's a kind of a push and a pull at the same time. Um, but we're looking at ways to enhance the uptake through request to pay mechanism, perhaps, if that's what users want. If they're looking for ways to do fraud scoring, um, this kind of thing can also be offered. And these have been mentioned by users, and I think uh, as this becomes more of a mainstream or the new normal, uh, these kinds of things will be absolutely necessary. Okay, thank you. And my, my second question is you've been up and running now with RT1 for almost a year, uh, but now TIPS is coming. So what's your take on uh, TIPS? Uh, you embrace it, you love it, uh, you hate it? Uh. <laughs> well, I, I think the, the, the TIPS is good. 
It's very good. And I think the idea of, of ensuring reach, and if you want that to go faster, um, I think it's important that, that there are alternatives. Uh, the private sector has produced something, um, and that's good. And I think the public sector is also looking to make sure that it's complementary. And we have uh, a long history of operating side by side in the pan-European space, uh, first in high value and, and, and now in the, in the retail space. So I think whatever works to get banks up and running and the, the citizens of Europe the access that they need at a cost point that they can afford um, is a good thing. Thank you. Uh, so let me now move to, uh, to Martin. And uh, first I want to actually to ask Martin the same question that I asked uh, Eves about uh, the need for a, a European-based uh, global uh, payments mm -hmm. uh, system and how, how that could come about. And then I have a second uh, question that I will ask mm -hmm. that later. So please, Martin. Uh, thank you, Anders. Um, and I think from a broader perspective, all these developments that we have just talked about are very, very welcome. You know? And there, it's not only the ease of uh, consumer experience and seamless things and all these kind of things, but also uh, on a broader perspective, uh, at least a couple of, of issues where I think it is very important. One is, at the end of the day, also geopolitical risks. You know? Being reliant on kind of uh, solutions provided by other jurisdictions could be risky at some point. Okay, so having this is very important. Uh, another issue is, is of course, uh, you know, the governance standards, AML issues, um, you know, all these uh, cyber security issues. Uh, this is very much an issue of hygiene. So if we can do the same thing on a pan-European level, it's going to be helpful for everybody individually. So we have the infrastructure, let's make the best use of it. And it's only going to make our economy stronger. At the end of the day, there's also another issue. You know, the euro is the second most used currency in the world. Okay? You know, about, as we saw just in the recent, uh, you know, uh, uh, speech by Juncker saying that, you know, about 60 countries are in one way or another linking their currencies to the euro. Okay? Having your own currency as a reserve currency is by all means very beneficial. Okay? So I would say that having up to the kind of uh, standard, you know, and uh, state-of-the-art payment systems is very critical seeing where the technologies are going. Of course, cash is always be there and most often of course, for contingency reasons, like Eve's Smith just highlighted, you know, the taxi ride and these kind of things. So cash is going to be there, and the global spread of the euro as means of payments, you know, having uh, a reserve currency most likely will spread, and that would be beneficial for us. But developing these payment systems, making the best use of them, is of course also very, very critical. So as a macroeconomist, you know, I'm very happy about it, you know. And we should, uh, you know, move forward with these things. You know, we should provide the central banks, we should provide, uh, and also the private sector initiatives, we should provide the opportunities for businesses to innovate. You know, and that could help the European economy. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And a quick, uh, a quick second question about, uh, I, I feel I have to ask about the electronic clearing system of Latvia's bank, the EKS. Uh, so given now tips coming, uh, uh, well, what future does it have, say, in two years, three years, five years' time? Yeah, well, we are not the new kids on the block, you know. We are around for more than a year, you know. So, you know, TIPS is only uh, coming operational in November, so we have some experience to share. But on the serious side, of course, you know, we are open to cooperation, you know, and uh, we will try to, to help out, you know, the private sector to join in, and by and large, the view that we have in the, in the Central Bank of Latvia is by and large the same as that of EBA. You know? Yes, we are also shareholders in, uh, in the TIPS project, we participate in that, and we will try to merge these things together with uh, our own payment solutions system, uh, infrastructure things. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, so far it has been uh, still mostly about uh, Europe, although it says global trends uh, in, in payments. Um, so, and uh, that's where uh, Tepo comes uh, in now. Uh, Tepo, I, I want to ask you, I mean, you have lived in the US, you have spent time in China. 
Um, so how do we uh, Europeans uh, look uh, from, uh, from those perspectives? So are, are our payment systems and payment solutions really state of the art? Uh, or is there some, something where we are lagging behind, say, uh, China or lagging behind the United States? Uh, what's, what's the very global perspective on payments? Sure, thanks. Uh, I, I think I do need to do the mistake of, of uh, wasting a good or, or uh, messing up a good story with facts. Uh, the tennis wasn't professional. Uh, okay. uh, sure. <laughs> but, but I tried to make it professional for a year and the end result was I, I have a, a problem with my knee so now I'm working with a bunch of fintechs instead. <laughs> um, so my view is, is mostly um, retail, consumer oriented, and, and, uh, and the kinds of roles that I've had have had a lot to do with kind of trying to figure out where does the disruption come from, how does it, how does it you know, who, who is going to be the leader, and, and, uh, uh, and how does innovation spread in the markets. So if we look at from, from that angle, so consumer and, and, uh, and more the retail end, not that much the back end, the wholesale, the infrastructure, so, um, first of all, the disruptors are, I did not come up with an example where it would be a bank. Uh, so, so, those who actually uh, drive uh, change in consumer behavior are, are very, very rarely banks, even when it is about payments. Um, <clears throat> the, there, there are a few different kind of global ways of, of how this uh, goes about. There are, um, and especially if we kind of look at one of the biggest uh, changes has been moving to mobile. Um, so you have the kind of the African example where the, the telcos drove usage of mobile money um, for all kinds of different use cases. And, uh, and, and actually, as a general trend for those countries where you have low card penetration, and where you have low penetration of bank accounts. In other words, you have a lot of uh, unserved customers. Um, the, the change happens faster, the change to mobile. Um, and um, so, so there's been the kind of telco-led Africa, start, you know, started in Africa, probably starts happening in Latin America as well. And the, and the first use case really was, was payments, but you had people who already had customers, um, like the telecom uh, providers. Then, then there's a different uh, version of that, where you have the internet companies who uh, have a large customer base and then turn that customer base into a payments uh, uh, account. And the, the leaders there have been the Chinese. If you look at uh, the Chinese mobile payments uh, market, it's 98% of that is two companies, so Alibaba and, and, uh, and WeChat. And, um, and, I, I, and there's, the, there's the kind of the most interesting market maybe from that uh, angle is India, because you're going to see or you are already seeing the, maybe the first proper battlefield between the Chinese internet giants and the US internet giants. So you have Paytm, which is, which is backed by, by Alibaba and Alipay. Um, and and uh, then you have um, Google, who has their, their payments. WhatsApp started their payments. In other words, Facebook uh, uh, started their payments in, in India. Uh, so, and, and there, the kind of, uh, I think there's, there's a, there are two different ways of, of how these companies look at payments. Some think of it as a revenue source that, that I provide, which is a typical internet business model. I give you something for free, and then, I, then that makes you my customer, and then I make money on, serve, on offering you something else, like, for example, a payments account. Then there are others who think that, um, that actually payments is an interesting source of data. So I'll, I'll actually, I'm not going to make money on payments, but I will get all of the data on you, uh, which then 
gives me a possibility, for example, to go to lending. This is very relevant in, in markets, especially in markets where you don't have a good um, uh, credit bureau. Uh, you might have a blacklist only that you only know the bad guys, but you don't know how good the good guys are. Um, and uh, one of my favorite, uh, uh, actually, investments that, that I made at BVVA is a company called Guia Bolsa in, uh, in Brazil, which started from uh, a personal financial management um, a angle and then basically ended up with having the best credit data in the country. And now the, the banks are... are uh, um, are using that as a basis for their credit decisions, even though they don't see the data, they don't see the algorithms, but they still accept uh, the kind of the black box solution that comes from this one startup in a market the size of Europe. Um, and and uh, now there, what is the most important part of that data is the payments transactions you make. It's the incoming, you know, you can do the math of, well, you clearly make this much money per month, you clearly spend this much money, therefore this, the difference is what you can pay for, for your loans. Um, so, so you know, in terms of U.S. and Europe then, um, U.S. is probably ahead in, in uh, kind of online uh, payments experiences, um, the, but but at the same time, the it is still difficult to pay your bill in the web uh, from your bank account, and and uh, so so the and and that's because the infrastructure is outdated, uh, very fractured, uh, very fragmented, and and uh, so the. So what has been good is the kind of the companies who hide all the complexity that's underneath and then still provide uh, interesting uh, services to, to, the, um, to the end user. But, but that's why there are lots of payments companies in the U.S. who the, what they do kind of wouldn't make any sense in Europe um, be, because those, thi those things are solved by, by the infrastructure. Now for, for European companies then to succeed for let's say European startups or fintech financial technology companies to succeed uh, globally, what you need is a single, a truly single market. Um, my experience in, in kind of trying to take fintechs from one country to another in, in Europe is actually, you kind of think that, well, regulatorily there's a way of passporting. So I have a, I have a license in, in let's say an e-payments license, which is rather light. I have that in one country, and I'm going to take my business to another EU country. What you learn is actually it's not the passporting of the license that's the problem. It's all kinds of other laws, business customs, regulations that have to do with other things of how do you, you know, how do you market your service, what are the privacy rules in a country, etc. That that still end up with you having to go from a global scale, if you look at China, India, US, I mean, Europe should be one place, going from a 1 million, 2 million, 5 million, 10 million country to another 10 million country is, is not very scalable if you have to provide a very different service. So anything that can make the single market a truly single market uh, would be really good. I could go on to the technologies, but I think I'll but stop But if you now. take a side step uh, or a side avenue, I guess that's also the, the reason why uh, generally uh, the, the birth rates of uh, global internet uh, platforms or internet businesses in, in Europe are rather poor. Uh, I mean, uh, Spotify is, uh, is, is perhaps one, uh, one exception uh, to, to, to the rule. Uh, but, uh, but to follow uh, up on, uh, on, on your uh, uh, intervention, would you then agree with uh, my earlier statement that payment cards are uh, still kind of interim uh, step uh, and that the future is, uh, is, is mobile and we'll simply keep using payment cards because we have uh, invested so much in the, in the related infrastructure? Yeah, whether it is, a, um, whether it is your SEPA account or your 16-digit card scheme account, it doesn't really matter. Okay. And underneath, if it's efficient and fast, great. You're going to tokenize that anyway. Okay. And then the token is what you use for, for the different 
transactions. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't think that kind of the means. People still carry cards. Seems to work. Um, you you can use your NFC on your phone, and most even an, even Apple has that nowadays uh, in, in, enabled. But but it's you know I don't think that's really that much disruptive if the if the rails underneath are still the same. If it's still Visa, if it's still Mastercard, and and then because once the rails the rails actually dictate the business model, so it's still the same parties who share the the fees in in similar fashion as before. So um, you know, they, they, I'll stop there. Okay, but I, I have a second question. Uh, so where where would the the, the real disruption in uh, in European payments market uh, come from? Uh, would it be uh, China? Would it be the US? Would it be some of those uh, global uh, social media platforms? Uh, would it be something else? Uh, would it be tips? Uh, what's, uh, what's your guess? Uh, I, I, I believe uh, somewhat to this theory that somebody uh, um, presented to me, which was the kind of, if, if you think about how internet companies or, or yeah, or consumer internet companies think, think is you've got customer acquisition, then you have engagement, and then you have monetization. And uh, so this theory basically says that the one that has most engagement, which means you know, number of uh, interactions with the customer per day or minutes of usage or per day, is going to win. So if you, if you think from that assumption, well, bank, you're not being used, you don't use bank that often, so banks are going to lose when it comes to then. Then you can say, well, maybe e-commerce then. Well, you, you, know, you buy stuff every now and then, you buy, but you don't do it every day. So, so uh, then you have social uh, companies, and maybe the number one would be messaging, because that's what you use most often. And, and it gives you, because for two reasons. One is, you know, the more interactions you have with a customer, you're front and center, you're at their face all the time, so you can offer things. And then the other is you have more data. And in the end, this is a data game. And, and the, in a data game, the winner, eventually we're all going to have all these great data scientists and all these great algorithms and robots and artificial intelligence and machine learning. Everyone's going to have that. So then the winner is going to be the one that has most data. And it doesn't matter whether it's banking payments or some other digital services. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, the next topic I would uh, I would like to address is, is regulation, and um, there of course uh, to come back uh, to a European uh, perspective. And uh, actually, before the conference, we discussed with colleagues uh, how to put uh, in, a, in into a short summary or in a nutshell uh, what is going on in the in the European uh, payments uh, market and. Uh, I tried hard, but I must say I, I failed, probably uh, because of a lack of uh, in-depth knowledge, or uh, I don't know. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, in, in those situations, so then it's, uh, so it sometimes helps uh, just if you use a metaphor. Um, so if you cannot really explain complex uh, things, uh, what's going on, you can use a metaphor. And together with uh, a few colleagues, we, uh, we found a metaphor uh, on YouTube. Uh, as people sometimes do, and please uh, have a short, uh, have a look at a short video. <laughs> well, I, so, sorry for the disruption uh, to the panel. <laughs> Uh, but I think that uh, fairly accurately and correct, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, fairly accurately describes what is going on now in the European uh, payments market, uh, in particular with the Payments Service Directive uh, 2. Uh, and uh, well, what, uh, what we meant by the raccoon, of course, is uh, the fintechs uh, who come in uh, and they steal uh, a part of the cat's lunch. And, and the cats are uh, obviously the commercial banks in uh, in, in that metaphor. Um, so uh, 
would you agree, first of all, to this uh, this metaphor? And let let me throw this at, uh, at, at the whole panel now. Uh, and, and and if yes, uh, then uh, is it uh, PSD2 uh, that let in uh, that, that kind of left the gate open uh, to the yard and, and let the raccoon in? Uh, so uh, uh, and, and and if yes, uh, so if no, then let's see where we go from there. But if yes, so is it an example of a kind of uh, good regulation, if you like, that actually facilitates innovation. So who would like to take up uh, the raccoon and cat story? Yves? Okay. Uh, let me first stress that uh, the raccoon is an animal that is alien to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It, so that hints at China now? It or? has been introduced uh, and uh, I'm second. Uh, I'm sure that at the second time he comes back, the cats will behave differently. <laughs> uh, this being said, uh, I think you have to uh, make different uh, statements. Regulation is one thing. The PSD2 was not to protect the banking system, neither against small competitors to banks uh, in payment systems, nor for GAFAs or Bain's uh, uh, Alibaba uh, or Chinese. Uh, it was uh, to have European solutions in the interest of the European consumers. So that is the objective of the regulation in this area. The second level of regulation that is important are common standards. I'm not sure whether it, does, whether it is up to the public sector to provide harmonization to the last centimeter of a business area. I think there is a huge part for industrial standards to be provided and coming up uh, by the private sector. And we have several initiatives, uh, for example, in the Berlin Group, uh, or we have other uh, initiatives where standardization uh, is being pushed forward. And whether standardization should be European or global, again has to do with other pieces of, in, of uh, regulation. Now, what Teppo rightly said is, in this area what is hugely important is how do we deal with data, data management. And there I have been recently at the conference on artificial intelligence where I was impressed by someone who said, well, what is the driver is the culture vis-a-vis -vis the management of data. In the US, the objective is profit maximization and nothing is above it. And that is driving innovation. In China, the second largest player there is a huge motivation in driving technology in order to maintain social control of society. And if those two major forces are dominating Europe, while we seem to have a different attitude to data protection or to protect the values of our society, then we can only succeed if we become our own leaders of our technological developments. And that is where we have to create the European market. And that is what we have to do together with the private sector and the public sector. So I think this is the broad uh, setup framework where we have to achieve consensus and within which we have to work. Now, who will be the winner in a worldwide competition? That is an other situation. But let me say again also to the banks that if they create alliances with the GAFAs in order to protect against European fintechs, I think that seems to me the wrong attitude. So would you then do something about it? I said we will reflect very hardly how we try to preserve what I said it's a broad framework which is driving us and which is our mandate. Uh, I think uh, we should uh, 
not be naive when we talk about open banking, but we should certainly consider that this might be the normal for tomorrow. But it is how we are, are we doing it. Is it better to have uh, the GAFAs running Europe and our banks are only doing the fronting of it? Are we having the GAFAs moving into Europe through e-money licenses as all Americans do except the Apple Pay? Uh, are we uh, trying to have hard regulation on who is allowed to do business in Europe? I'm a little, little bit sceptical about such hardwired regulation if we do not have a consensus with the private sector on where to go. Would, would anybody else like to add to that? Or I see one related question on Slido, but if everybody wants to react to what Eve said. I, I can just say briefly, I think I, I took a slightly different message away from the, the, the video. Okay. Um, the raccoon is also, albeit a foreigner, is part of a larger ecosystem. And uh, while that particular snippet was focusing on getting a little bit of cat food, uh, it did provide benefits to the, the ecosystem around the, the, uh, the raccoon. Um, and I think the, the, the point of regulation uh, is not so much to protect, but rather to en enhance. And I think the idea that's really behind um, the, um, the regulations, especially PSD2, is that the, the supply of cat food does not have to be finite and that by opening it up, you actually create a, a, a larger ecosystem and more benefits for all, including raccoons and others. Um, and then combining that with the, the, the essence behind GDPR, which is, I think, most Europeans quite appreciate having the, the, the privacy element protected, uh, at a, which is quite different from other parts of the world, as, as Eve was saying. Um, I think that uh, that part, finding that balance between opening it up and uh, not... Uh, having the cats, let's say, murdered by the raccoon is, is, is the tricky part. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I want to throw in two questions from Slido, actually two related questions, uh, which I, I, I will make into one question. I, I saw two questions about anti-money laundering and, and know your, uh, your customer, which are obviously uh, very, very important and, and, and related. Um, so, uh, are we now uh, kind of, uh, having regulatory arbitrage that uh, the banks are, are subject, commercial banks in particular, are subject to one set of rules and then there are uh, fintechs who are subject to slightly, uh, say, uh, uh, less strict rules on that? Uh, is it because the amounts, the size is uh, different uh, or uh, is it not the way I described it? Uh, who would like to take uh, up that? I, I, if I may, yeah. you know, very briefly, I think it certainly is an issue. You know, of course. You know, if you have a road network and then you just drive the cars, but then somebody appears, I know, with something absolutely different, uh, it's going to break the bridges. You know, so yes, this is an issue of importance, and that's why kind of supervisory oversight and some of the regulation in this area, you know, to have a level playground. No, if I may say so, it is very necessary. But of course, this should still be flexible enough to allow for innovation. Mm -hmm. okay. There is a trade-off. Yeah, so, well. yeah. If, if you if you uh, compare um, digital companies in general to uh, digital financial companies or fintechs, uh, the biggest difference is KYC, and and uh, um, and and. Or you could say the, the, the part where you lose most customers in the, kind of in the onboarding process is KYC. And, and uh, uh, so in order for an innovation to be successful, uh, which obviously requires acquiring customers, um, going through the onboarding, the, the biggest issue is, is KYC, and it is not the same in every country. It's not the same in every European country, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. um, there are the, as, and, and everybody wants to do the same thing, which is, I want to acquire my customers so that they can do it themselves, end to end, without providing anything on paper. Now, that doesn't mean that it's unsafe. Uh, it, it just means that you have to have different tools available. So anything that, that is, makes you know, digital identities 
safer, better, uh, you know, hopefully with biometrics, etc., the better. Uh, and, and, uh, and it's good for the economy. Now, is that going to lead to the winners being companies from, or in the private sector, being the co companies outside Europe or within Europe is sort of something that uh, is very difficult to regulate. Uh, I, so, so uh, you know, if somebody is really good and they make billions of dollars today and they want to invest that in winning a new market, they might just win. And um, now, so, so there, I, I think there, there are different areas where, so the, uh, then that leads to information security, obviously, that you have that data somewhere. And um, now everyone's been hacked. Nothing is ever locked. Uh, Aadhaar, which is the identity system of India, was hacked, and people can create new people, even though there's, you know, iris and fingerprints. So you can create new, you know, persons in the system, which is a bit scary. Um, and uh, and Facebook was now hacked. Facebook, which is technically one of the best companies there are, you know, you kind of Facebook and Google are way beyond any bank that I could think of in, in terms of technical capabilities. Uh, but even they were hacked. So everyone's going to be hacked. And when you think about, well, how, how are you, what are you going to do about it is, is maybe you shouldn't be so tough on the security part, but where you should be tough as a regulator, as, as lawmakers, is, is, is privacy. And, and uh, there's no reason not to, well, this is obviously a value statement, which you know, is, is not fully objective, but there's no reason not to implement kind of the European way of, of thinking in, into, uh, into the privacy requirements and be just as tough whether you are a company that just started yesterday or whether you are what was the oldest bank in, in the world. So those should be same requirements. But, but make it easy to, to acquire customers into, into digital services and you will see more innovation. You, you mentioned uh, cyber uh, threats, basically, and okay, one, one thing is a, s a certain platform or, or provider being hacked, but uh, then uh, an entirely different thing is uh, if you have your, uh, your whole payment system or large parts of payment system uh, basically uh, shut down by uh, malware, as, as happened a year ago in, uh, uh, in, in Ukraine uh, with the not Petya story uh, the, the summer before uh, this summer. Um, so uh, what's, uh, what's the solution to that? If, if there is a solution, uh, should, uh, should we create some kind of backup uh, based on, I don't know, digital, uh, sorry, distributed ledger uh, technology? Or uh, should we simply uh, all have uh, whatever, uh, 30 euro or 50 euro of cash in our pockets? Uh, what, what would be the solution to that? If I may still continue on, on, just yeah. on that particular part, is, is uh, there are many good practices that are available that are not being used. Uh, you know, many of the hacks are because, because somebody just did not do an update on the patch from you know, whatever provider that, whose technology they're using, that it was known that it can be hacked, and it was hacked. Surprise. And, and uh, um, so, so, so there are many, so I, I, I'm actually working with this one startup which wants to make, uh, make uh, encryption easy in all kinds of different, and they're, they're targeting emails first because only 2% of the world's emails are encrypted. An email is one of the, the first ways that you, for example, do phishing or, you know, take Usually there's some weak link, even though the, the basic system that you're, you end up hacking is, is secure, etc. But you get somebody's credentials, for example, via email, and then you get uh, in, into the, the core system that may have things like customer data. So, um, so the, the, there should be rather strict enforcement of known good uh, practices. And even after that, people are going to be hacked. <laughs> okay, Hayes, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I think uh, there's um, 
it, it's unfortunate that those things happen, but as, as a famous bank robber once said, you rob banks because that's where the money is. But um, I, th I think that there's been a lot of activity in this space in the last in the last three years, both in the public and the private sector. And I would I would really point out um, the activities of SWIFT in this regard, with its uh, customer security program, which have really upped the game for its participants uh, and made sure that some of those basic hygiene elements are, are uh, really part of daily hygiene. And I think that's really good. And on the other hand, I, I would uh, call attention to the uh, efforts of the um, CPMI or the, the, the BIS and here in Europe of the um, European Central Bank. And uh, there's been a lot more effort in, in, in trying to coordinate um, activities between financial market infrastructures and making sure that best practices like, like hygiene are in place. And that most importantly, that there's some sort of mechanism for being able to share threat intelligence and react in a, in a, in a timely and adequate manner. Okay, thank you. Anybody else wants to uh, join in on cyber? <coughs> Let's be very clear to start with. Increased reliance on technology and increased interconnectedness inevitably lead to increased risk in cyber. So if you go both ways, you have to increase the amount of resources, human and capital, that you dedicate to cyber protection. And this is not something you can only leave to the public sector. The public sector can bring in some standardization again, can bring in uh, some common rules, uh, but it is also up to the private sector to be aware that this is a logical path. This is an equation that holds. Mm. The cost of doing business. Yes. Thank you. Martin? Well, no? I only have one comment. Okay. My hobby is not email phishing, it's fly phishing. <laughs> 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 you know? but, uh, but overall, kind of, uh, yes, the cyber issues, of course, if it becomes more technology based, you know, it opens many more opportunities for, uh, for risks, you know, many more avenues. And uh, it's, it's both private sector and the public sector and also the consumer of the service. You know, it's also the individuals who should be serious about these things. So, you know, these are risks that come, you know, with the game. Okay, thank you. Uh, so one, one more topic, actually the final topic that I have on, on my list before we, we open up uh, for, uh, for, for questions also here from the, from the floor, and, un, un, unless uh, uh, you, you want to... Uh, uh, put them on uh, on on a slide, uh, but uh, yes, the final topic uh, uh, that I have uh, here on my list is obviously crypto assets or virtual currencies. Uh, well, you call them uh, either that or or this, depending on on, on where you are. Um, so, uh, what's uh, what's their uh, future as a means of exchange, as means of uh, payment? So, will, will they remain uh, well as they are today, relatively marginal or marginal, or do they have a potential, or does that depend also on other things? Also, in in, in particular, uh, how, uh, how 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 well the the, the other payment systems uh, develop. Uh, so, what's uh, what's your take on that? Uh, I don't know. Tepo, can we start with you again? Um, yeah, I, I think that the the my money is pretty stupid, uh, and and. Um, and, and many other things in the world have a lot more smartness or intelligence than, than money. So uh, if you can make money smarter with, with crypto, um, then eventually it will happen. Whether it is one of the, the uh, models that we know today or one of the cryptocurrencies or there was discussion whether it's cryptocurrency or crypto asset, uh, I'm not sure. Um, which one? I mean, we do know that for many use cases, the uh, things like Bitcoin are just not scalable. They're they're not uh, fast and efficient. And, you know, we'll run out of energy in the world um, if, if if every payment would be Bitcoin. But um, but people will figure this out, and and uh, and then it 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 will happen, and it will probably be one of those that we don't even know yet that will be, or the leaders will be, maybe those that we don't know yet. Now, in terms of 
the underlying technology blockchain, then um, I like it a lot. And, and, uh, and there are, and because it is good for transactions, um, then it's quite natural that it would lead to a transaction leads to a payment as well. Um, one of my kind of favorite because of my own background of, of uh, uh, being in the kind of uh, importing business long, long time ago as a, as a teenager, I remember how difficult it was to do to buy something from, in this case, Asia. And, um, and it seems like it's almost the same thing now in 2018. It is difficult, complicated, expensive, slow. And, and uh, uh, so the, this just has to change. And why, why is it so? Well, because the incumbents want it to be so, because they make more money on it. That's one reason. But, but, but it's primarily because you don't trust the other side. And uh, if you have a model like blockchain, uh, where you can have a smart, smart contract which basically says, once I have received the goods, I, it will automatically, and, and I accept the delivery, it will automatically lead to a payment to the other party. Uh, this will happen. It has to happen. Uh, and and, uh, and there are, you know, one of my old colleagues uh, just half a year ago started a business exactly in trade finance, and, uh, and they've thought about the whole process end to end. It, I, it will absolutely happen. Uh, now, these are very specific use cases. It's not like your grocery you know, 10 euro quick payments, that's, that, that probably will be the last place where, where it'll happen. Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, I think kind of, if I look from the kind of economic perspective, then of course the definition of money kind of is relatively straightforward. There are three functions that the money has to fulfill, you know, and this is a store of value, unit of account, and medium of exchange. And the, I would call them crypto assets, Okay, rather than cryptocurrencies, you know, but uh, you know, many of them don't really work well in all three dimensions. They may excel in one, but they may fail in others. Okay, so um, but will the kind of the money per se will it change? Will it become more digital? I would say yes, of course. And one of the reasons is because the habits and customs of the users of money will change. They become more digital. And I would say that um, digital central bank money is only the issue of time. You know, it will happen at some point. You know, it will be kind of, if, if the central bank wants to remain relevant in many parts of the economic activities, be it also, for instance, monetary policy effectiveness and efficacy, at some point the central banks will be forced into this and uh, you know there is research going on and I would say yes kind of we don't kind of wildly talk about the uh, e-euro or something like that yet but I would say it's it will happen at some point my personal view is like that the only question is then you know what form will it take is it gonna be you know account based with the central bank or is it going to be on specific devices and it's going to be anonymous like cash currently is now you know that's a matter of development and discussions and there are pros and cons in each uh, solution you know but i would say that it is from my point of view it's quite unlikely uh, not to expect that from the central banks you know any time soon. And the quote that was there that I've been saying that cash will stay forever, uh, you know, forever is not really forever. You know? Well, there are yeah. still still books, uh, although yeah, there, sure. you know, yeah. people read online yeah. a lot, yeah. but, but there are still but, printed books. Yeah, but if the technological development will be, you know, ongoing in this part of the kind of world and in the kind of everyday life, it will become much more accepted. And this is what we see currently and what we've seen in the past years very strongly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I would argue that the um, majority of Euro payments today already are digital. Um, maybe not in, in the latest, greatest technology or blockchain, but uh, if you look at the statistics published uh, by the ECB, uh, between cards, push payments, direct debits, and um, other forms of services that are, are, are out there, a great percentage of the digital money, and people's salaries are paid digitally, people buy things digitally. 
So there's a lot of, of, of digital uh, digitalization already there. Now we're talking about new payment, new new um, technologies. What's the role of those? Um, and I think the, the, the once the hype has started to die down around um, Bitcoin and, and, and blockchain, then you can really get to the, the the real use cases of what that's what the the value is. And I think to, to prove uh, value, it has to be better, faster, cheaper, and hopefully all three. And some of the early implementations have been failing in many cases all three. Um, but nonetheless, I think the, the shift in mindset that comes from uh, the new thought paradigm around uh, digital ledger can lead to some very interesting uh, developments, whether it's in trade, finance, or, or, or other use cases. But I think one of the other key factors, uh, besides substituting for trust in a distributed way, really comes down to standards. I, I think you know you can have a great a great technology that's distributed and everything, but if everybody's operating on their own standard, then it, it is very difficult to make things work, and you end up with fragmentation and um, and, and high cost. There, there was actually a very specific question, though technical question, on, on, on Slido about common standards about QR codes. If you can show Slido, yes. Uh, so, what do you think about pan-European standard for QR codes to be used for payments at uh, P POS? Uh, so, uh, anybody dares to take uh, take that one up uh, in, in this context? As a consumer, I'm up for it. <laughs> Me too, but uh, I mean, uh, I, 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 I don't have the technical knowledge to, to, to comment on I'd, the technical aspect. I'd only make one point there, which is that the EPC, the European Payments Council, has developed a standard for uh, exactly. QR codes. Yep. And uh, now I think it's up to the industry to really use it. And I think it would very much complement uh, the pan-European nature of, of payments, especially at POS, and but not only. Hmm. I'm sorry, Eve. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's, absolutely, that's absolutely correct. I would have said exactly the same. Uh, let me just say a word about crypto assets. Uh, they are not fit for purpose for payment systems. Let's put it very straight. This is a speculative approach, and everyone who wants to burn up its, his savings can invest. But uh, that's it. Second, let's not mix it up with the underlying technology, DLT. But DLT comes under many different strands. Some are in a closed circuit and some are permissionless. Those who are open, like Bitcoin, have been designed in order to avoid any regulation and therefore there is also no liability. So obviously this is being designed to be outside regulation. You cannot come and ask now to be regulated and to have uh, the cake and eat it. So uh, let's be very clear, people have all throughout history have the fancy to print money. Everyone can print money. The problem is only that you convince someone else to accept it. And that is about trust. And that is why central banks, who have the mandate to print money, have to be very cautious when they introduce new technologies, that they are safe, that they are sound, that they are proven against fraud. And that is why we are experimenting with every new technology, including DLT, Distributed Ledger Technology. We have done it with other central banks. Our conclusion today is that this is immature for being introduced anytime soon in central bank infrastructure because it could undermine trust, because it is not mature. There are many open questions. Now, we are also reflecting on digital base money, but we have found out that before continuing, continuing to discuss on conferences, it would be better if we would agree what each one means by it, because there are so many different strands that uh, it is impossible to have a structured discussion about sometimes where everyone has a different view about it and a different basic understanding what are the concepts behind it. So let's first try to settle what are the concepts and then we can go about how to organize a structured discussion. So I'm afraid we are at a very early stage.
stage of uh, this development. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, I guess we can uh, we can uh, open it up uh, uh, for for questions from the from the audience uh, while we set this up. And of course, the first thing you have to do is uh, is, is yeah, the first thing uh, lights have to come on, but uh, then you have to raise your uh, your 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 arm. Uh, and then I'll point out uh, who gets the microphone. But uh, but before uh, uh, before that, uh, there was uh, I saw one quick question about tips and RT1. Will they be uh, connected, interoperable, or whatever the term was from 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 day one, uh, or uh, what's what's the situation? So maybe you can comment uh, on that, and then I, I look for the for the hands and arms in the audience. We have designed tips, uh, of course, in close cooperation also with. Uh, the industry and uh, it is uh, quite clear that uh, this uh, includes RT1 and it is compatible with RT1. Uh, so uh, that has been uh, since the beginning uh, but uh, those who do not want to use RT1 can also directly go uh, through TIPS if they have a, a bank account and that are all the Euro area banks uh, or all those banks which have a target to account uh, with the ECB. Yeah, I would second that. I think um, the, the design of the way we've approached RT1 is also to be completely interoperable with TIPS. Um, it's really important to the participants across Europe to be able to have that choice and to be able to switch and using the same standard and using the, the, the technical connect connectivity that allows it to happen seamlessly is really important to participants, not only from a perspective of reach, but also for resilience. Thank you. So do we have questions from the audience? We have uh, where? No, I don't see. Ah, yes, yeah. So can you can you yeah? Thank you. And, and briefly say who you are. Thank you, Sandra Lepinja, the CEO of the Finance Latvia Association. So first of all, tremendous thanks for the uh, event and the discussion. Uh, very timely, and great to see that we are among the first adopters uh, in what we see as a European-facing and digitally savvy finance sector here. I have a question um, uh, to Mr. Pavola, and uh, I would be glad if uh, other colleagues uh, would also join in answering on the KYC utility. Uh, you touched upon the very central issue of uh, making whether the European market or, or broader markets uh, work. And we are currently in early stages of uh, discussing a KYC utility concept here and uh, joining up all of the state registers. And uh, um, in fact, we'll have a council meeting today and we'll touch upon how we want to proceed. So it would actually be great to hear your views on the various models that you see in development, the Singaporean one, where the Monetary Authority of Singapore is taking the lead. So perhaps a role for ECB here, uh, or the Nordic uh, KYC utility ideas where the private sector has joined up forces, or uh, maybe some of the vendor-based solutions that uh, some of the uh, Thomson Reuters or, or others are, are proceeding. So uh, views on this would be helpful, and uh, there's also a standard setting uh, side to this as well. Thanks a lot. Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, I am actually not very knowledgeable about the different uh, different kind of country specific initiatives uh, uh, what I've seen is more kind of the practitioners uh, angle to this and and um, so uh, give you an example um, so one way that is acceptable in some places but is not acceptable in some other places is that you take a picture of your set of your passport and then you take a picture of your face and then you send them as as part of the the KYC process sometimes it in some countries in some use cases it's okay in some it's not and um, um, the so, so the as this varies between countries it is it is difficult for a new business for example to uh, to enter another country and um, then the, the the availability of the kind of ID verification companies um, also varies. Um, I, I think the whole kind of you know at the very high level the uh, the whole digital identity is is uh, some people think that banks and the financial community has already lost the game to uh, to the um, uh, to the internet platforms. Um, I would disagree with that because they they 
they have not gone to the level that you actually need for a proper KYC of, of being able to substantiate that this is the, really the person that they claim to be. But in terms of the different models, um, you know, as, as long as you just take the approach that, that it is available, it is available to everybody, and you can do end-to-end -end onboarding of a customer with that technology, then, then I'm fine. If, of course, it would be nicer if it was the same in every country. Okay. Uh, thank you. More, more questions, or should I take? Okay, I, I, there, there are two ve very popular questions on Slido. I, I, I have to take them. So one is very, very technical, uh, but uh, I guess very relevant as well. Uh, biggest obstacle for replacing card payment with other point of sale solution involving instant payments has been uh, missing uh, or uh, absence of reclaim uh, process. Uh, is there a plan uh, to, to regulate it? Uh, who feels uh, comfortable answering that question? question uh, Eves or well, uh, maybe just a word on the previous uh, question okay. you have the issue of e-identity which is part of the Commission's uh, action plan uh, for digital Europe and I think you have an eminent representative of the Commission on the next panel and he will certainly uh, be very central in uh, being able to give the most uh, up-to-date answer on this we are looking at it at the ECB uh, in the European Retail Payments Board uh, also from the point of view of the empowerment of uh, the customer from that, but that's only a small part of it. You look at it much more from the point of view of law enforcement, but law enforcement is part of the third pillar of the European competences, meaning that it is not a European competence in itself when it comes to criminal matter uh, and indictment and so on. But then there is a third dimension to it, that is the prudential approach, how the supervisor is seeing that uh, you uh, live up to the national regulations uh, that uh, regulate uh, the banking activities. But whether that should be done at the European level uh, is uh, also a very, uh, maybe too easy a question. What's the purpose uh, of having European standards uh, if the general e-environment in one country is not able to support uh, the highest level of control? So you see there are too many dimensions to it to give a quick and simple answer in uh, such a panel. Okay. Thank you. On, on this uh, question of, of uh, refunds or reclaims, uh, the, 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 it's, it, um, instant payments is not a retail payment system. It is a money transfer system. And, and uh, if, if you want to have a payment system that is used, uh, is, is the number one thing you've got to solve is, well, you know, somebody bought something and now they're going to bring you the, the goods back. What happens after that? Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and those are... Cons then, and then I'll give, you an, yeah, so I'll give you another part, which is... Um, you know, in different studies, uh, people, I mean, the, the consumer doesn't really care how much it costs to the merchant. Um, and, uh, and, and they are more, consumers are more likely to uh, sign up to a more expensive system if they are, for example, given bonuses, miles with which you can fly if you spend a lot of money, things like that. And, and uh, so, the, so the, you know, even if you have a fantastic underlying infrastructure, which is cheap and efficient and fast and instant, of course there will be less fraud if it is instant because it's good funds and so on. Uh, but but, uh, but it, it's still a different thing than a... And, and I think um, this is for, for other companies to, to build on top of the infrastructure that uh, has been put in place. I don't think that's a regulatory thing. It shouldn't no. be. Okay. I mean, no. regulators no. should not start going into, you know, what happens mm -hmm. at the refunds. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you for that clarification. Do we have more questions from the floor? No? Okay, then uh, there is one other very popular question on Slido. Central Bank of Latvia supports SEPA instant already a year, but our biggest bank, Swedbank, doesn't support that. So in reality, our customers don't benefit from that. What's your opinion about it and when can it change? Uh, unfortunately, there is only one, uh, one person on the panel I can uh, direct uh, this question to, and Martin, oh, that's you. You're welcome. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 
I used to work for. But eight them. eight people um, voted, uh, yeah, and okay, artists fine. posed the question, so blame artists. <laughs> Just shoot me. <laughs> no, I think uh, the very recent developments uh, are that uh, uh, they will join very soon. No, uh, by soon meaning perhaps this month. And uh, what does that mean? It means that instant payments will truly become industry standard in Latvia. You know? So it is almost here. Okay. So it's, it's just a few more weeks. There have been some delays as far as I understand. Uh, but uh, you know, we're very close to the full implementation of these things in the Latvian market. And as I mentioned, this will be industry standard by then. Which is, I think, very, very important. Okay, thank you. Uh, more questions from the floor? Don't see anything. Okay, then I just continue on the on the Slido list uh, for a while. Uh, although, well, we discussed payment cards uh, quite uh, quite in detail already. But there is a question: uh, What is the future uh, for for POS terminals? Uh, mobile and PSD2 payments can be made without uh, POS terminals. Obviously, uh, there has been much investment into those things. Uh, so, what's going to happen uh, to that? Uh, will it have to be written off or uh, what? Who would like to take that? Well, I, I think uh, it's again a question of definition. If you uh, think of the POS uh, as a machine or a device that is put on the desk, uh, of course uh, that will evolve, uh, just uh, like everything that we use in daily life is evolving. Maybe in the future the POS will be embedded in your telephone. Uh, so, but it might still be called POS uh, for the purposes of charging fees or for other purposes, collecting data at least. So certainly uh, there will be evolution and uh, the uh, content of a POS uh, will in itself evolve as I think that all the payments industry will in the future have uh, concepts like embedded payments, uh, which means that you only give authorization or payments initiation once, and then in the future it will be automatically charged to your account. There will be machine-to-machine -machine payments where uh, through AI uh, there will be contracts uh, which evolve. There will be uh, other uh, technologically driven uh, enhancements uh, which uh, makes that the traditional devices that we have in the back of our head will not be visible anymore, but might still exist, but in a much more efficient uh, way. Okay, anybody else? So that, that relates to also one of the earlier questions of, of the QR codes, and I, I just have to plug this in here, that, that uh, if you haven't seen, please go and Google for Chinese beggar QR codes. Uh, so, so what what you see is is a common. Uh, I mean, you, you you can in in the biggest Chinese cities, you can definitely live cashless nowadays, and the beggars learned it as well. So, so uh, as the two leading mobile payment systems have 98% of the market, all you need is the two QR codes that are hanging here. And then you know you can scan the QR code and, and basically give money to the beggar on the street. So so um, now could they have three or four or five? I don't I don't think you need to have a standard. But QR is one way of getting uh, rid of rid of the, the the terminals, and the the cost of the terminal is actually um, often a key reason for a small and or new merchant not to take card payments. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so you know, you can get around it in in various ways, obviously, and and um, you know, it can be a a, a, a app to app payment, um, and and then you know, just to mention another company I'm working with, uh, the the is where you can actually take a card payment so that so that you put your in a safe way you can put your card a pin code on the on the glass of the merchant or in other words on the mobile phone of the merchant um, so th so there are there are ways to get around it the issue of course for a merchant is if you've got you know 30, uh, 30% 40% 50% of your customers come in and they have a card what do you do 
you know, are you going to tell them, no, I'll only take these kinds of payments, go and download the app and connect your card there. What people want is that, that payments would just go away and you know, not be part of the process. That's why U Uber became so successful originally. Yeah. And, and uh, it just should happen in the background. It should just happen. Okay. Thank so you. speak as not, yeah, not a DBA clearing, but as a consumer. Um, okay. Please. I think the worst thing that, um, that I could imagine is going into a, a, a store and seeing basically the equivalent of a mobile phone antenna there with all of the different hardware pieces. And I think uh, the, the POS providers have really tried to, to collapse and, and innovate. And I think you've already seen it, and you're already seeing it in some, some places where a QR code could be shown. And it's not only an NFC, and it's not only uh, um, uh, magnetic. Um, and I think that that breeds a little bit of innovation in addition to the app-based uh, uh, developments, which actually drive the POS to be better and yeah. hopefully faster and cheaper. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, more questions? All right. There is uh, then probably final question from uh, from Slido uh, to this panel: um, How big threat uh, for the market would be uh, the concentration of payments in hands of large players such as uh, large uh, internet uh, platforms or social media uh, platforms uh, if they were to take uh, the majority of private uh, person payment interface? Uh, so, who would like to answer that one? I think it's already, no heaves, it's, it's already today uh, you have the possibility of what I would call the checkout free solutions uh, where you walk into a supermarket, you help yourself with what you like on the shelf and you walk out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then your account is deducted. But the one who is uh, filming you and who is uh, collecting your data uh, through the different uh, cards that you may still carry and through your social security uh, code and so on collects data. What is happening to those data? So it's again a question of data management and uh, to what extent do you feel more at ease by being made out of glass or do you feel more at ease uh, by being uh, a part of our traditional societies uh, where privacy is still something that we valued after what happened in the World War II? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I, I, I think that is the, the primary worry is, is, is the uh, private person privacy. Um, no, I, I, I remember in, in um, one negotiation with, with um, uh, one of the largest tech companies in the world when, when I said, well, if you worked with us, and their, their business is based on advertising, if you work with us, we could, you know, we could together define whether the ad that you posted on a page actually led to a purchase. And their answer was, we already know. <laughs> and uh, so what does it mean is they are actually buying the purchase data from, from different places. Now, this was in the US. Uh, but but, uh, but the, the, and, and similarly, you, know, you have companies, many of the internet companies that are fighting head to head on something. And then you notice that you are on one of their pages and they are serving they, they're serving you ads based on data that only the other company can have. In other words, you know, these two competitors are still selling data to each other. Um, so, um, you know, whether they then, whether it's your person-to-person -person payments platform or not, it's, it's a very small part of the total problem uh, of, of privacy. Okay, thank you. Um, so I see we have six minutes left for the panel. So it's uh, uh, or sorry, Mark, I'll just one uh, one minute for yeah. you. No, just a very brief note. Of course, privacy is also a thing that is developing. You know, that's a concept or the value that is very different across generations. I value it very highly. I don't do anything bad, but still, I want some privacy. But uh, for instance, my kids, you know. Their notion of privacy is something absolutely different. It's much more 
you know, relaxed. And they are the future, you know, consumers. Maybe they grow they up and run. become less I relaxed. Guess. I would say that. I, I would say actually, there's a chance that that could actually happen. And and one of the the, the advantages of banks still is that they have not so far exploited the data too much and still have more uh, trust in that relationship. And so when they do evolve into that or want that sometime point in their life, they may look to their banks to provide that for them. So it could go back and forth. Sure. Okay. Yeah, out of the tech companies, it's actually interesting that Apple may be the company that has, at least they're in the top five in the world of who has most data on you. If you are an Apple, if you have Apple devices, they really haven't monetized that. Mm -hmm. They they don't serve you ads. They don't use almost any of it. They don't sell it, etc. And uh, well, they're still the, the the most valuable company in the world without exploiting that advantage that they would have. Let's see how long it takes before they give in. Okay. <laughs> so th thank they go you to for the dark side. Th thank you for that. Since you mentioned Apple, well, um, um, I, I was thinking I have to wrap um, wrap up and, and summarize the panel now, which I will not attempt to do, but. Uh, uh, because there have been so so many things uh, here uh, that that have been discussed, but uh, but one thing that comes to my mind, uh, since you mentioned Apple, uh, well, back uh, at the end of the 1990s, uh, uh, Richard Rommelt, who is a well-known strategy professor, so he got uh, to sit down with Steve Jobs, and uh, and he asked Steve Jobs a question, obviously about strategy. So he asked, what uh, what will you do now? And uh, Steve Jobs uh, repl replied to that uh, famously, uh, I will wait for the next big thing. Uh, so uh, a couple of years later, the next big thing uh, turned out to be the iPod, and, and then all the other uh, things came after that. But uh, to rephrase that question, uh, or to pose actually that, that question uh, to you, uh, well, we have e one minute for each of you, and my question is uh, to end this panel, uh, is what is the next big thing in payments? Can we start with you, Teppo, and then come uh, all the way back? I, I, it's, it's, not, it's not a one change, but payments becoming more and more like any other kind of digital service. Okay. Martin? have more than one minute. Yeah, you have one minute, we have three in total. Yeah, I would say kind of in general, you know, just read science fiction. Okay? Because, you know, most of the stuff which is you know, supported by physics or chemistry and what thing, people will kind of invest enough time and money into it, it will come as, as a thing, as a living thing, thing. So read science fiction, that's what people are thinking about, most likely that's the direction it's going to go to. You know, it's only a matter of time, most likely, if it's physically possible. Okay, but as to small things, you know, as I already mentioned, you know, the instant payments is going to be industry stan standard in Latvia very, very shortly. You know, the next kind of small incremental thing, the kind of the Central Bank of Latvia, the Bank of Latvia, is uh, creating a register of phone numbers and bank accounts. So, it will open opportunities for. Uh, payment providers, you know, phone to phone payments and things like that. Um, but from the central banking point of view, yes, exactly as you said, but that also means I would still, of course, the definition is not clear yet, um, as, as Yves mentioned previously. But I would say for the central banking, perhaps, uh, digital currency would be the next big thing. That would change quite a lot of things. Okay. Case. What's the next big thing in payments? I, I think the point that, that uh, the ECB and EBA Clearing have in common is we're, we're putting the rails in place for instant payments. The next part has to happen at the, at the bank, the fintech, and the consumer, consumer level in order to bring it up. And whoever manages to, to do that in a, um, in a way that the customers like to use uh, is economically efficient and removes the pain of paying. I think will be very successful, and you know that's that's the role of, of the market to figure out what that is, and that's where the competition really needs to happen, and uh, and should evolve, and uh, that's what I hope to see. Very prudent answer, uh, Yves. Uh, what's the next big thing in payments? I think uh, the biggest things are societal change or behavioral change in society, and. Uh, 
we have been living up with payments being something different from the act of buying. And uh, as uh, Tepo has said, I think in the future payments and buying is moving much closer to become one act and people will not consider payment as something different. That is creating behavioral change uh, and that I think uh, is not yet there. We might wish it, it might be driven by technology, but that is a big change. I do not think a moment that digital based central bank money is anything that any of us on the panel will still see during his lifetime. Okay. And let me say one other word. Infrastructure, and I said trust, is something you do not subject easily to big uh, changes. Because you have to convince the society at large that this needs to be done. There was one question on our next platform, on Target 2, uh, will there be digital ledger technology? There will be the next platform not before 21. We start already thinking what, and we are now merging Target 2 with Target 2 Securities, making one bit platform with different services. But the next uh, platform will already need to be prepared right now. And since I said that right now we consider DLT as asking more questions than being able to deliver answers, it is not mature to be used on a central bank platform. So, if anything, if I could make a very speculative guess with as a central bank I should not do, it will not be on the next platform, but at best on the one afterward. And I would say that other technologies like cloud are probably much more promising in being used in the central bank world uh, than, uh, for example, DLT. Okay, thank you. So now, now I have a summary sentence for uh, for for this. Uh, what what all of you said to simply summarize it. I, I guess I can say that in the future, uh, paying uh, will be uh, an integral part of buying and and not a separate process. I guess we can wrap up the uh, the panel uh, with that. So it has been an honor for me to moderate this uh, very great uh, panel. And you've been a great uh, audience uh, helping me uh, with, uh, with uh, great questions. So thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, and let's thank the panelists. Okay, and now we have uh, the, well, pleasant uh, thing of a coffee break. Uh, so coffee should be served outside.